Okay, Jim, I get you come up on the stage. We've got your PowerPoint set up. Um, I think you've got a different microphone. Here you go. Um, yeah, I've done enough talking. I'll let you go take over. How are we doing? All good? Thanks very much, Julia. Um, yeah, so Julia's introduced me. My name's Jim Fletcher. Uh, I work for the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries. I'm based in, in Mackay, but I do a lot of my work over with the more extensive beef over the hill. Uh, but I have been in Mackay now for quite some time. I think myself and my partner came up from South East Queensland in 2007. I came up as a cane agronomist for Mackay Area of Productivity Services. So some of you guys, I think, you've got cane. I might, I might have done helped you with your, with your cane as well when I first came up here. I came up here as an agronomist. I got the job as an agronomist. I saw cane two days before I came up. That was my introduction to, to sugar cane. So um, anyway, previously, in a previous life, I've, I've worked my whole life in the beef industry. I worked for Consolidated Pastoral Company for quite a few years um, on their big concerns in northern Queensland. I uh, I worked for Warwick Cattle Crushers, building the big hydraulic setups for for those northern operations for many years. I uh, was on the road with my family, driving cattle, syndicate mobs across northern Queensland for three years during the early 2000s. It's pretty dry in western Queensland in the early 2000s, I tell you. Uh, and now I'm, a, now I'm a, or have been a, a government officer. So plenty of guys around here know me, but I, I, I see a lot of new faces in the crowd as well, which is excellent. Um, it's good to, to meet new people, and I hope I meet many of you in the next two days. I think this will be a, a very good opportunity for us both. I'm not going to stand up here like... Um, I do have some expectations for the day. I held off on Julia. My expectation of the day is that I not stand up here like Jim Fletcher, English teacher, and money, talk down to you, that I know everything and that you know nothing, because collectively, within this group of people, you know much more than me. You are the guys who run your operations. You know your operations. I can learn from you, and you can learn from me. So let's, let's commit to that for the next two days. OK, so a couple of things that I'm going to do today. Um, some people will know a lot of the, a lot of the uh, types of things I'm talking about today in my presentations um, and there are people who will have been introduced to them for the first time today. So what I'm trying to do is just find a watermark today of, of understanding of some of the concepts that we talk about in managing beef businesses and in particular in man managing this, this concept called land condition. I'll turn that on and then it shall work. Okay. Um, we deal with this concept a lot in, in grazing land management, being a DAF officer primarily concerned with grazing land management, and I see, I see beef cattle production as a bit, of a, a bit of a food pyramid, if you like. A food pyramid you used to get belted with back in the 80s and 90s, and the bottom of that food pyramid used to be, used to be uh, whole grains uh, and cereals, and they thought that wasn't very good, so they changed it then it became fruit and vegetables. Well, the fruit and vegetables of, of beef business and of managing beef production is grazing land management. Because at the end of the day, these cattle are just big lawn mowers on four legs. So if we manage that bottom pillar of that pyramid, we manage the vast majority of the issues that we come into contact with in this business. And the way that we measure that, or the way that we try and, or the, or the language that we use, in measuring the quality of our land is land condition. Now, would somebody, maybe I'll get somebody to run around with a microphone. I wish I wasn't getting the pregnant lady to do it, but anyway, so okay, <laughs> right, I, I kind of feel bad. Uh, can somebody hazard a guess or give me a bit of their definition as to what they think land condition is? Well, what is land condition to them? If they're looking to the quality of country, what's the land condition to them? Bruce, can I pick on you? Ground covers. Ground cover? 
ground cover, portion of ground cover is definitely one of the measures that contributes to land condition. Good one, Bruce. We've got another one over here. Try and think of what are, what's an overarching definition, bringing all these smaller things in, to, in, to, in together. Not having your land overstocked and looking after your grass that way. Definitely. That's one of the biggest contributors to whether we have good or bad land condition. Excellent. Multi-species and grasses and legumes. and Having diversity. Another good factor. All contributes to land condition. Well hydrated with bees, butterflies, etc. Well hydrated. So water and the water cycle is very important. These guys over here are going to talk more about infiltration and how important it is to, to growing grass, but it's definitely a good contributor. Anyone else? Okay, so our definition as we use of land condition is the ability of an area of grazing land to respond to rainfall and produce useful forage. So how is your country positioned so that when you get a wet season, it can utilise that the nutrition that it inherently has in the soil, the species that are available in the paddock and the rainfall that we get during the wet season to produce useful pasture for the bovines or whatever animals that graze on your land to be profitable for you. Okay, does that make sense? Why is this important? Well, it's pretty easy because it underpins the sustainability and the profitability of our businesses. Everything links back in terms of our seasonal resili resilience, in terms of hitting markets, even in terms of our overall mental health, I guess. When your country's not doing so well, when you're going through a pretty ordinary year, you don't feel great about it, do you? You know? But if you know you're going through an ordinary year but, you, but your paddocks are well set up, your property is, is a bit of a drought buster in terms of its resilience, given dry years, that puts you in a good position mentally as well. And I mean, that's the reason why we do a lot of these things is because it makes us feel good. And so that's why land condition is important. So assessing land condition. From our DAF perspective, when we assess land condition, we look at three critical components. Soil condition, pasture condition, and woodland condition. From our perspective, the soil condition is extremely important. Jeff and John are going to talk about that a little bit more today as well. But from our, my perspective as a grassologist, as one of the many things that I do, some of the things that I want to be seeing when I look at soil condition is things like how stable is the soil environment? How is it uh, positioned in terms of when large rainfall events occur that it's going to actually stay in the paddock? and not be fish food out to the reef. Because at the end of the day, a lot of these systems that we're talking about, they degrade based on top topography. We're all here as part of a greater overarching project, project, which is managing the reef. A lot of our funding comes from managing the reef, but, but land systems and environments degrade by topography. So let's look after our country first to ensure adequate health of the reef. And through doing that, we look at our soil condition ratings. So in terms of soil condition, ground cover, as Bruce brought up, is a pretty critical element. We want to be maintaining adequate ground cover. Doesn't tend to be so much of a concern here in Mackay Whit Sunday. We average 1.6 metres of rainfall. If you are not maintaining large levels of ground cover, that's probably pretty almost impressive, to be quite honest, if you can get low ground cover. Um, but in terms, of, in terms of that ground cover, uh, I'll talk about that more in terms of pasture condition. Now, in terms of soil condition, um, do we have factors affecting our soil that are preventing its ability to grow grass? So do we have compaction? Is there a sealing off effect? Are there issues that we can see clearly on the soil surface that will affect infiltration? affect germination of seed, affect productivity of good grasses. Um, have we maintained our, our, our top layer of soil? And also, something that's also critically important is, and that we look at when we do a lot of our assessments, botanelling and um, land condition assessments in a lot of our grazing trials, 
is this proportion of litter. And we get a lot of this in Mackay with Sunday, and this is something that you, that you should really be taking into account is what's our level of detritus on top of the ground? How, much are we, how are we retaining our residual levels at the back at the end of the year in terms of how much grass we're leaving behind so that we can grow good levels of grass that when bovines come through and graze it, there is that de detachment and there is that processing of, of dry matter back down into the ground to maintain good little levels. Do we have just a soil? Do we just have soil or do we have litter and then some incorporation of that litter back into the soil? Because that can, that can affect um, nutrient cycling for our grass and also infiltration of water. I'll keep going, pasture condition. Do, are we preserving good perennial long-lived species that are productive and that cattle can graze to put on weight? Are they in good health? Are their growing points preserved? And are they given a chance to respond to rainfall, given a good residual grass remaining at the back end of the year? to grow more grass, very important. Also important consideration is the woodland condition. And I guess the, the easiest or simplest way that we can criticise this is, are we growing or do we have trees growing in our paddocks that are contributing to the system in a positive manner in terms of many of the, many of the grazing systems that we interact with in Northern Queensland, Northern Australia, what we call open woodland systems so like our iron bark, poplar gum, blue gum, um, land types, it's good to have some sort of trees, some sort of upper story maintained within these systems. But when we start to get a little bit like this picture here, where we start to get too high density of trees, it starts to impact on our growth potential of grass. And there are many ways that we can try and mitigate that, manage it a little bit better. But we need to know that trees have an impact. They, they want to grow and live and procreate just the same as our grass and that they will limit our growth potential. Okay, so any questions about that, guys? Anything anybody wants to add to what I've just said? Any differences of opinion? All good, righto, I'll move on. Okay, so the way in which we, we compare and measure land condition within our paddocks is the ABCD method. And who, put your hand up if you've come into contact with this method before, the ABC land condition method. So some people have and some people haven't. It's pretty simple, guys, um, and it's based on a lot of those prescriptors that I just talked about, those three prescriptors. So basically, if your country's in, in A condition, it's as good as it's going to be. From a sustainability perspective, from a land condition perspective, from an ability to grow grass perspective, it's as good as it's going to be. Good 3P grasses. Does anybody know what 3P grass is? I'll get to that. We'll talk about 3P grasses. But I good. think they just shy. I think they know. They do? Yep. OK, Let's good. Let's put the pressure on. OK. <laughs> so I know someone knows. What do the 3P stand for? Productivity is number one. What else can you... Just think of the cattle. Like, when you think of feeding your cattle, what's important to them? Palatable. That's perfect. Thanks, Bruce. Say it again. Perennial. Very good. Excellent. So those three were... Perennial. Does anybody understand what perennial is? So it's the other side of annual. So if you've got a perennial grass species, number one, it's long-lived. It doesn't just live within the year and then come back as seed. It, it's long-lived. It grows. It's interyearly. It's got an interyearly or over-yearly growth cycle. It's a long-lived plant, perennial. Uh, palatable. There's no point having a grass or a cow paddock filled with really nice grass if cattle don't want to eat that grass. Okay. And the other one is productive. Does it reserve enough energy or enough nutrition within that pasture that when that bovine ingests it, ruminates it, it actually puts weight on that animal or it does something in a productive manner for that animal? 
So we can talk about we can talk about some species of grass with the Mackay with Sunday area. So if I was to talk about something like Calide Rhodes grass, 3P, what do you reckon? Perennial? Does it grow does it grow more than 12 months in a 12 month cycle? Yep, can grow for years and years. Is it uh, palatable? Palatable? Sometimes too much so. So palatable that sometimes it moves out of the system because it gets overutilised. Is it productive? Definitely. Holds nutrition and grows enough bulk. That's the other side of the coin. It's got to grow enough bulk for them to actually utilise it. I'll give you another one. How about, um, how about Paspalum, Plas, sorry, Paspalum placatulum or Rods Bay placatulum, which was a type of grass that was implemented by the DPI in the 70s and 80s, I think, put in some grass trials, but has not proliferated through Mackay with Sunday area, but some people would know of it. Does anybody know about Placatulum or Paspalum? You know that one? 3P? Perennial? Productive? Could be. Palatable? Sometimes not, yes. Okay, so that's one. Here's another one. How about, um, does anybody know Indian cooch? So Indian cooch, uh, perennial? It's called a weak perennial. Sometimes it grows most of the time unless you get a really bad year and then sometimes you may have none of it. So weak perennial at best. Palatable? Is it productive? It can be. If well managed, it can grow enough grass to be palatable, to a productive enough, but the yield consideration with Indian cooch, I mean, we see some of the yields coming out of Indian cooch are quite low. So obviously this whole 3P concept, it changes depending on what sort of varieties we're talking about. So it's something that we need to be thinking about in terms of what's filling up our paddocks. But if you've got a conditioned country, you've got a paddock full of it. And that's the number one consideration for land condition, is the proportion of 3P grasses is what drives land condition, okay? Moving on to B condition, you still got a wonderful paddock. You may have a couple of weeds coming in the system, which may not be desirable. Um, Generally what we see is that land condition between these two can move back and forth based on good or bad season, okay? The other thing is good, well-managed paddocks, I believe, sit around about here some, most of the time. If you have a good year, it can move back up here. If you have a bad year and you manage it well, it stays here, you don't want it to drop down again. But I really think this is what we need to be aiming for is be conditioned paddocks. C condition, we have a couple of bad years, we had a big influx of weeds, something's happened. Okay, the energy has shifted, there's been a significant shift in the energy within what's going on in, this, in that system, which has led to a decline to C condition, where we have lots of undesirables coming in and our paddocks are not responding to rainfall and producing useful feed. Just like it's taken significant energy to bring it down, it's gonna need to take a significant bit of management to bring it back up. But you can, by spelling country, by looking after it, by maybe looking at putting some nutrition, some sort of inputs into the system to help bulk it back up. Once we get to D condition, that's where we need to start putting serious money in terms of machinery, um, really rehabbing the system. Okay, does that make sense? You don't wanna get here. Once you get here, there's a very good chance that it's not economical to get back here, okay? Make sense? So, reliable rainfall and favourable growing conditions make Mackay Whitsunday a premium location for efficient grazing systems. I've lived here for 10 years and I believe this thoroughly. We have lots of adverse conditions in Mackay. We have lots of wet weather. We have lots of little bitey things and uh, sometimes nutrition's not that great, which uh, limits us in terms of operating within some of these higher market specs. We can't make big bullocks most of the time, these sorts of things, okay? We are limited a little bit there. 
but we get reliable rainfall. And that is a far, I would take that 100 times over, have an A-grade country. You can have all the A-grade country in the world, if the cloud doesn't go over the top of it and rain, you got D-grade country, guys. So I really think that there are many, many, many opportunities for profitable grazing systems in Mackay. But achieving this, 99% of getting there to achieving this is basically just making sure you have dense boards of three pea grasses. If you get there, you're sweet. I sell pretty simple messages, guys. Okay, we've talked about three peas. Here's a little example of some A-conditioned country. This, this is a paddock um, that was owned by our old cane agronomist, Johnny Hughes. A few people might know him. So he was a pretty smart guy. He worked for Croker's Rule for a long time. And uh, he helped sow a lot of the buffalo grass country over in CQ. He kind of knew what was driving the system. He drove the system through um, intense pasture agronomy and inputs um, because he was an agronomist, so he didn't mind throwing a bit out of a bag, I tell you. Um, but also knowing when to pull up and maintain good residuals in his pasture so that his pasture responded. And obviously through that, this is just one monitoring site on his property, which was basically that particular site is 100% signal grass, but good 3P coverage, excellent health in plants, a good productive environment in which bovines, which just want roughage and good quality roughage, are going to thrive. Make sense? Okay, there's a few more different things going on here. So this is what I would consider. We have another signal grass paddock here. And this is the back end of the year rather, so everything looks rosy here because we're in the wet season. This is the back end of the dry season and another property. We still have good coverage of 3P grasses, all signal grass in here. But we have other things impacting in the system, notably a bit of weedy sporobulus, which is an undesirable. It's okay to have a little, little bit of it, but you have undesirables coming in. So what do you reckon we'd give that one? A, B, C, D. B? Yeah. We also have Tell you what we have here that we don't have at Hughes's. It's these little green tussocks, which you can't identify, but a lot of legume present in that paddock. Second style over Verano style. Good contributor to diet in bovines. So that's another good plus. We've got diversity, but we do have things coming into the system that are impacting on it that we need to manage before it starts to drop down to a C. So we can do that through weed management. So getting the spray, spray tank out, but we can probably go much further by making sure that these residuals of grass at the end of the year are a little bit better than worse. Okay, this is a paddock on the same property on the other side of the, of the laneway. We've got B condition here. What do you reckon we've got there? We've got a lot more broadleaves coming in. We've got a lot more undesirables within the paddock in terms of those sprobular species. We've got a lot less 3Ps and we haven't managed our residuals quite as well. So, C condition. What's our first port of call if we've got a paddock that lo looks like that? What do you reckon we should do first? Speak up. Rest, 100%. If you want to fix a paddock first, don't go spending money, give it a rest, see what happens. Good. Say it again. Rest the paddock and um, get a soil test. 100%. Excellent answer. First, first port of call should always be rest. See what comes back. Give it a couple of years. Let it try and sort itself out. Okay? Country is very forgiving. If you give it a bit of a rest, you'll be surprised at the results. But if you want to take it further, a soil test to understand if there's any holes in terms of the nutrition of these grasses is, yep, excellent. I'll, I'll talk to that. I'll talk about that. I'll bring that up in the next session, mate. You put a pin in that one. Don't hold, it, hold, it, hold me to it, okay? Good question. Okay. Here we got a bit of a nightmare. The wheels have come off. 
Can somebody give me an idea of what sort of species we have going on in this grazing environment? Just throw a few at me. Sickle pod here. We've got sickle pod in the flats, lantana in the background. What sort of grass species have we got, do you reckon? I think we've got all the cooches. We have diversity of cooch in that particular. You'll notice there's no staff in this photo. That's because I slipped through the fence and took a photo of this one and I didn't, the people didn't actually know I was in this one. <laughs> anyway, you need to get photos though. So, um, so basically you have undesirable non 3 p species of grass where we have grass. We have blue cooch, buffalo cooch, probably a bit Indian cooch. We've got sickle pod, undesirable and lantana. So we don't get these big scalded areas like we do in, in, in the extensive areas of, Maca of, of Queensland, which we would call D, where we've lost our topsoil, where we you know, have gullies and big holes in the ground. We don't tend to get that so much because of our rainfall, we maintain ground cover. Our D conditions happen when we have these really prolific weeds come into the system and we have to spend lots of money to get rid of them. But without a doubt, what got these people to hear was those two things. Mismanagement with bovines. Add two things, mix them together, and that's what happens, okay? These weeds don't come in by themselves. We, we all manage them to a degree, but where they proliferate, where weeds proliferate should be telling you something. It's giving you feedback that there's something going on. Okay, any questions? Well, I thought to, um, to mix things up a bit, I always come up with new ideas. I thought I'd give you maybe, what I want to do is, um, we're starting on this end in the far back there with, um, with you, Laughlin. Um, so you pair up with the person next to you on the right, and then again, you know, Mark joins up with Sharon and so on. So you pair up basically. And I give you five minutes to just reflect on what you've been listening to and then formulate some of the questions or comments that come up in your discussions. So I'll leave you to it for five minutes. Have your partner on, on each side there, on, you know, pair up. If you haven't got a partner, couple up. Same here. Just give you a bit of time to reflect on what Jim has been telling you this morning, what your thoughts are around it, if questions come up. So I'll give you five minutes. And I'll just, I'll just walk around. If anybody's got any questions, just pull me up. That's a good idea. Just raise your hand. Hey, mate. How are you? Not too bad. How are you going? Yeah, not too bad. Yeah, no, you totally agree. The placatulum? Have you, got, have you had paspalum on your property yeah, before? Yeah, yeah. I see him. Um, I took a little bloke there just recently that had some... Um, that we had actually planted. He bought a block down towards Seaforth there, on, and um, yeah, it was in low country, and it, and it seemed to prosper there. But the cattle won't eat it; no. they don't like it. I mean, the best example is that um, Coonabit Springs there. Yeah. I mean, how many times we drive past that and they're right that turn off back? It looks like a million dollars. Yes. Grass. Yeah, but there's nothing in it. They're all logging all the native stuff on the and eat and eat the tea trees up yeah. on the hill, eh? Yeah. That's right. Starving. Yep. Exactly. So they they're the the cattle will tell you a fair bit, eh? Yeah, that's it. Yep. That yep. was a bit of a bloody, that was a bit of a handball from uh, DPI, that grass. Eh? <laughs> it was, it did. It looked good, but they don't like it. <laughs> Definitely not. No. Yeah. Did you go to the stream? I don't know. Any questions, guys? All good? All good here? Yeah. Yeah. Right, eh? yeah. All good, Chrissy? Yeah. We're just pretending. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, wrote, I wrote this slideshow about three hey, minutes ago. Right. It's the best statement I've heard. Oh, yeah, yeah. I always saw that one. <laughs> yeah, when you're an idiot, you've got to use all the catchphrases.
Having had a little little to and fro with your partner, is there anything that anybody would want to add to the discussion so far? Any little pearls of knowledge? Anything that people have seen that sort of melds into what I was just been I've just been talking about? Any want to be brave and and offer up some advice, opinions, knowledge? I'll yes. Start with you, Bruce. Maybe here. Yeah, I'll, I'll open the can of worms, Jim. I've just been talking to the lady next to me and every slide you've had up there, in my opinion, can be, any problems can be attributed to grazing management and every solution is grazing management. Ah. Totally agree. That was why, and that's why I put that as the sort of the full stop to that section, Bob, is because at the end of the day, Prior to white man's influence on this part of the world, we didn't have these weeds totally encapsulating the areas, you know, heinous weeds. It's the interaction between our grazing environment, us and our animals, that either promotes good land condition or poor land condition. So I totally agree, 100%. Another one over here. Uh, so basically, um, preparing your soil before you actually start the seed. So don't just. I've been Lachlan from Cropwise. So I've been. To, I went to a job last week, and we went and planted grass seed, and it hasn't come up. And we've done a soil test, and it was lacking nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and zinc. So I guess spending that hundred and fifty dollars before you even start on projects is another good way of to try and save the money in the long run. Yeah, definitely. So I was talking about the economics of this to this, and that's what we're talking about probably or what you're sort of hinting on, Lachlan, when you're talking about, you know, rehabilitating these pastures if we want to have these really intense grazing environments that we can get to in Mackay with Sunday. Um, if we want to put money into doing that, rehabbing paddocks or making them better again um, for specific purposes, 
special purpose paddocks. We don't put money into paddocks unless we've got an outcome, unless it's for a reason. Otherwise, it's a waste of money. So totally, how you, how you prepare those paddocks, and I'll talk about that in a minute, is very important. Uh, Jim, that before anything goes to seed, you could slash that. That's mulch. No, that not that one. The naughty photo. Yep. Before it goes to seed, slash that. That's mulch. Utilise the weed to work for you. Oh, definitely, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's different ways that you, can, that you can manage these different weeds, 100%, yeah. Yep. The other way is just locking your animals up before you put them out to the paddock. So you will cattle them in from the dough yard, lock them in the yards for a week before you, empty, you move them out to your paddock. That'll yep. stop the spread of your weeds coming in from other properties. Definitely. Um, Lachlan was saying about putting them in a paddock before you move them to another place. Yep. My feeling is that you do that, you still, if you bring cattle in and you put them into a paddock with rats and they've got rats tail in them, it's going to go into that paddock. So if you, the next lot of cattle that come in, that rats tail's coming up. So the first thing's going to do, as soon as you bring them out of that paddock, it goes to the next paddock. Then it just moves on and on. Yep. It, it, I think it's a big percentage has got to be come back to being in the yards and locking your cattle up for a week and emptying them out before you bring them out to your property. Yep, yes. You know, biosecurity is definitely, especially in this part of the world, which is the Macquarie Sunday Weed Herbarium of Australia, which is what I like to call it. Um, we need to be full bottle it on our biosecurity concerns, both from our animals and from our grazing land management perspective. So we do have some bad weeds and we can mitigate that through biosecurity, but we do a larger proportion of it through the mitigation through how we promote our other species as competitors against our weeds. So it's, you do everything, everything's important. Okay, so I'll move on. So um, having lived in this part of the world for, for a fair while now, um, what I guess I, my summation is, is that most properties are a mixed bag. So every property has a little bit of A and every property has a little bit of D. So it's normally the proportions of B and C that make the difference. Makes a difference from how much time you have to put into chasing weeds. It makes a difference in the quality of the cattle that you turn off. It makes a difference in how you're hitting market specifications. It makes a difference in your general demeanour as a person. So knowing this, how does your property stack up? And where are the biggest opportunities on your property? And we've got a, we've got a couple of mapping guys here today, and I believe that that's probably the best place to start. Because your property is a mishmash, paddock by paddock, of these condition ratings. So it's always worth spending a day or so having a look at how land condition varies across your property, generally paddock by paddock, or land type by land type. Okay, and if you don't know, who knows what land types are? In Mackay with Sunday, I think there's nine land types or types of country specific to Mackay with Sunday. It's a good thing to know, guys, and the NRM groups and ourselves have publications that can give you a bit of feedback on those different land types, how we can utilise them in a grazing perspective. Knowing land condition, knowing your land types and having a bit of a plan as to how you're going to make the stuff that is not quite where you want it, where you want it, is pretty important. And I think it starts with a map. Okay, so how can we improve land condition 1.0? I have a number of these slides and they talk about various things within the business, not just grazing land management. Because when we go and talk to people in their businesses, having properties that are lower in land condition are not always tied back to this guy just doesn't get land condition. Every single business that we go to have has different issues, different challenges, and different things that are happening in the business that is actually contributing to potentially to poor land, land condition. These are one of the, some of the some of the straight up practical things that I see around the place. 
that you can do if you want to improve land condition. First of all, reassess your long-term carrying capacity. So what is the baseline carrying capacity on an average season, which is, what is an average season? We don't have them. We have big ones and we have little ones. Generally, we never have average seasons, but we need to pick somewhere in the middle, okay, as a point of call. What is your long-term carrying capacity for your property? Who knows their long-term carrying capacity of property? These guys do? Excellent. Excellent. Great. Okay. So it's important to establish a baseline, guys. Okay, so long-term long carrying capacity, just if you want to follow my pointer, is basically if we have a graph, you know, and the y-axis is um, how many cattle you run in a paddock, your long-term carrying capacity is like a laser. Just it doesn't change season to season. But if you know it, at least you've established a baseline. And then if you have a good year, you can go above that baseline. If you have a bad year, you can go below that baseline. But at least you have a baseline established. Until you have a baseline, you've really got nothing to go off in terms of the feel of how many, how many cattle should be in a public paddock for a prescribed amount of time. Things that can influence carrying capacity. There's one thing I know without a doubt is that there is less fertiliser going on paddocks these days. Certainly since the 70s and 80s when some fertilisers were... Well, how was fertiliser in the 70s and 80s, huh? A tonne. What was the cost of fertiliser? Urea. How much was urea fertiliser in, in the 70s? Pretty cheap. A lot cheaper, people used to throw it on, be fairly liberal with it. Whether that was a good thing or a bad thing, what it did was promote a lot of nutrition to pastures and make them quite competitive and grow. That's died off quite a bit. Now, I'm not advocating for people to go out there and start throwing fertiliser on paddocks everywhere because in many cases, many productive systems, potentially that's not a sustainable way to go, like I said. If you've got a special purpose paddock, maybe you can push it along a little bit more. But we know less is going on. And in Mackaywit Sunday, we are dealing with a lot of species of grass that were born and raised on either an African delta or some hollow in South America. And we plucked them up out of there and we come and stuck them on an ancient landscape, almost devoid of nutrition, which is Australia. So if we want them to keep going and proliferate and breed and be productive and successful, we either need to be looking at how our nutrition is being influenced in the environment or adjust our stock and rates accordingly. Because I see a lot of stock and rates that have been employed in Mackay with Sunday are still the old rules of thumb from when people used to pile it on. Make sense? Cattle are getting bigger. If we looked at the breeds of cattle and the types of cattle in 1970, 1980, when a lot of our rules of thumb stock and rates that we employ in Mackay with Sunday, they are a lot smaller than they are now, trust me. We used to deal with mid-frame size cows and now they're, you get around to some fellas' places like Jurassic Park out there, bloody, a couple of bloody dinosaurs. Cattle are getting bigger. Bigger cattle eat more grass, so you need to reassess your long-term carrying capacity. Has the class of animals changed? If you used to run steers in a paddock to a turn off, there's a fair chance that paddock got a spell at some stage. If you change that class to breeders, you're now running a specific number of adult equivalents for a longer period of time because they're not leaving. Okay? So take it into account. Pastures are getting older. As they get older, the whole epigenetic effect starts to happen and they become a little bit less sort of dominant in the environment. So is there a need to rehabilitate the species of pastures in your paddock? And more weeds are present. If we're getting more influx of weeds, if there's more weeds in the paddock, there's less space for grass. And so we need to be more conservative in our grazing, not only because there's less grass there available for the cows, but also if we maintain higher residual levels at the back end of the year, we're more competitive against those weeds, okay? Make sense? Any questions? Any comments? Anything anybody wants to add? 
okay, do a pasture budget. Pretty simple. It'll assist you in, in assessing your long-term carrying capacity, and it's very simple. We just take our total useful available pasture, how much is there which is truly available to these bovines, minus the demand, how many bovines there are. I'll skip through this pretty quickly, but it's just for tomorrow, when we do our pasture budget out in the paddock, and for those people who aren't coming tomorrow, well, you just miss out, sorry. Um, we need to be thinking about that it's not all going down that bovine's neck. So we have total pasture yield, which in some cases might be 10 tonne to the hectare in this part of the world, because we grow plenty of grass, but we have a fairly large amount of detachment. 15% of your yield is detached when cattle go into the paddock, either leaf drops in essence or them knocking it down. That's a minimum for Mackay. It's a lot higher because we have more grass. A lot of it's unpalatable. If it's weeds or old feed or dying, it's unpalatable. And we need to maintain a residual. Okay, so the rest is what's available. It changes for every type of grass particularly that detachment part. If you have very dense sward of stoloniferous grass, you're going to have high detachment. We need to streamline the demand of the cattle on our place based on the class. Whether it's male or female doesn't matter too much. The weight is important. We have a standard unit which is adult equivalents which is around about a 450 kilo steer or heifer, is one AE. When she starts to lactate, she eats more. Goes up 35%. Wieners are obviously less. Our smaller husbandry animals like goats or, or sheep are considerably less. Um, although they eat very differently to, to cattle, being teeth graders as opposed to tongue graders. How can we improve our, our land condition? 2.1. Let's reassess our soil capacity. Talked about those land types, those nine land types. A lot of those land types are based off vegetation and soil. So within Mackay with Sunday, there are nine soil types with very different inherent qualities. And it's very useful that you know those because if you know the inherent qualities of the soils, you know what their capacity is in terms of you managing them for better productivity. Yeah, the gentleman over here talked about doing a soil test. We're doing a soil test to find these out. What is our pH? You know, uh, what is our texture and structure? Uh, what's our, there's, there's a number of other ones. I won't get into it today. If anybody's got a soil test and they want to talk about it, Thank you. By all means, let me know. We can go through it. Macronutrient reserves, N, P, K, and S, the four big ones that help to, to, um, to feed those grasses. What, what reserves do you have in your soil? And also, a lot of the smaller ones, micronutrients, are less of a concern unless they're in large deficit. Things like molybdenum, if it's in highly deficient molybdenum, don't try and grow legumes. Things like that. So insert, insert soil test here. Um, now we're going to move on a little bit different to a little bit different part of the world. So how do we improve land condition from a herd perspective? I'm not, I don't think I'm talking to any large scale or extremely large scale beef producers here. If you're, I don't think, most people are sort of within the smaller to mid operational levels, would I be correct? We've got Rob and Ainsley today from St. Lawrence. They've got a large property, 12,000 hectares. I know Bob Harris has quite a bit of land and Mark and Sharon. Any, any other larger properties or, are we, well, what's small? Small is your 100? Uh, say uh, under 800 AEs or over 800 AEs? Maybe lift your hands if you're under. I'm under. Okay, so in those sort of, I mean, 
what I'm, I guess what I'm getting to here is operating in the smaller levels of scale, we need to be as efficient as we possibly can in our efficiency. And one of the, I guess if I'm trying to sum that up in one sentence, it's if you're in a bovine production business and you are looking at which ones you want to, particularly in this current price environment, if I'm looking at which ones I'm going to get rid of and which ones I'm going to keep, keep those animals with the most value ahead of them. Growing animals, pregnant cows have a lot of value in front of them. Keep those ones. Okay? Think about what you're going to do with the rest. Is our herd structure profitable? Knowing that there's a lot of profit ahead of growing animals, do we have our structure in our business correct in terms of how many breeders we have in the operation versus those growing cattle? Can we have less breeders and hold down to our growers a little bit longer? Because a lot of the herd modelling we do through our options analysis shows that that's probably a more profitable venture because breeders are unfortunately a bit inefficient. Are we maximising turnoff? Have we done super due diligence in terms of hold on to a better market or is there a, just a better market somewhere else for the animals that we are already producing? Okay? There is help available. We have economists in DAF, in Tennyson Street that are, can help with these options analysis which is a little bit better or a fair bit better than back of the envelope stuff. Okay. Improving land condition 4.1, I'm probably going a little bit over time, but I'm nearly finished. How do we, re should we reassess our core business and our objectives and what we want as people, as people within the business out of our business? What do we really want from our business? So from a, from a business, a strictly business side, are we able to service the debt levels that we currently have? Just so you know, when we go to a lot of properties, or the properties that we see that we assist in the beef industry, particularly in a lot of extensive production systems, generally these four points are the first ones I look at if I see that there's, not, if there's an issue with managing land condition. When you first drive onto the property and you see that it, you know, maybe they're struggling a little bit, doing well, these are the first four points we actually look at because this is what drives land condition for the most part. If your debt levels aren't serviceable, it makes people more prone to overstocking because we always run the numbers game based on, or there are people out there that run the numbers game based on servicing debt levels. So leading into that, what are our realistic production levels for the business? And this is where it comes down to good communication within people of the, within the business, within mum and dad and the kids. So there's an understanding of what the realistic production levels for the business are. So everybody's on board. Because sometimes there's people within the business may think they're running VRD when they're not. Okay? So tying again, how does this tie in with our income requirements? If we are pushing our country too hard because we want to achieve these production levels or service debt, maybe we'd be better off pulling back a little bit and actually looking at trying to service our income requirements based on some more farm income. What opportunities are out there, guys? And the other thing is, what is the current family dynamic or expectations? What's going on within the tribe Okay, in terms of where people want to go. You know, you've got this plot of land, where does everyone want to go with it? You know, do they want to be on it? Do they not want to be a part of the business? There are people that you can employ within the, within, within the beef industry or within the agriculture in industry that can facilitate those discussions to a higher level. You know, facilitate um, succession and all these things. Because I'm serious, these four things generally are what impact on that. Is there any questions on that? I've probably done a deep dive there a little bit, but that's my, 
I'm giving you feedback on what we see. So there's always help available, guys. There are farm financial counsellors within DAF. There is QRA, which used to be QRider, which can help out with other things. Use them, they're available. So that's basically me. Thank you very much for your time. Now, is there any questions? I like to do the, uh, the exercise again. If you agree, if you like that. Did you like that little exercise of paying up and having a bit of a discussion? <laughs> we can switch the other way now, have another partner. Let's give that a go. I, I liked it. I like you reflecting on what was learned. So let's go the other way. Um, does that make a difference? No, it doesn't. <laughs> well, pregnancy brain, sorry. But, yeah, just have another three minutes di discussion. And, um, yeah, I like to just have a bit of a share and pair at the end. Jim. Um, do you want to do anything before I do that? Just a little bit of an added bonus. People. Um, People. Uh, I know uh, die back. Die back is the new buzzword. 
uh, and people are concerned about issues of dieback, I just want to give you a little bit of feedback of some of the stuff that we've been doing. It's a little bit of a trial. We have six properties that we are monitoring that we found um, in Mackay with Sunday area for that held, had symptoms of dieback. Um, the main species of grass in that was Pangala. Now, of the, six species, of the six properties where we're monitoring, we have not had any properties uh, increase in, the, in, in areas of dieback over the six properties. This property in particular, we've placed a trial on, a plot trial, looking at different treatments. Uh, we made our, assess our first lot of assessments in, in November 20, and we just did um, our follow-up assessments end of wet season yesterday. So this is hot off the press stuff. Um, this property was severely affected, patch of Pangola with a dieback. Um, the average ground cover for the site was less than 30%. Um, and when we assessed it in November, the average yield in a property that's pretty well managed um, was, three, was only 300 kilos per hectare of dry matter, which is like one round barrel to a hectare, which is not very much at all. And I'll show you the photos in a second. We assessed it uh, yesterday. Um, we fenced it off. So it's all been spelled, even the control treatment. So we've got three treatments, which is a control spell. We harrowed to remove... Um, dead matter off the, off the site and fertilised and we did another treatment where we properly just farmed it back up with new species of grass. We used jarrah grass, Rhodes grass, Ceteria and V8 Stylo. Fast forward to April from November, 30 fold increase in yield across all the treatments. Okay, so it has recovered quite well from dieback. Here's the photos. You can see a lot of dye out in the Pangala. Very little ground cover. That was in November. Same photo, same place. There's the house. There's the house. Same place in April. 10,000, 10 tonne per hectare of grass. So my first recommendation, if you believe that you have dye back happening in your paddocks, is don't panic. Don't go out and spend money working it up, reseeding, doing all these things. Just look after it and wait. There's a lot of stuff in there. There's a lot of broad leaves. This was basically Pangala. That was a Pangala monoculture. Just by spelling it, there's now, I think there was 27 species that we use Q Gray's numbers for. So I went from one to 27 species. Okay. Yes, yeah, yeah. So we're going to maintain that site. We're now grazing it. Got plenty of, plenty of those bovines in there, giving, giving a lawn mow for us, and we're going to check it again in November. Excuse me, how long did you keep the cattle off that paddock to get past you like that? Uh, that was spelled from the last week of January till now. Okay. Like they all increase, but what? Doing absolutely nothing was the best method, except for spelling it at this point, which is which is understandable because when we so with the offset, we offset it twice, so we removed all ground cover, so everything's coming back from seed. So it's more that we get we get um, our build up effect to yield in the second and third year when, whenever we we work ground. And we've also disturbed through the harrows. So it's understandable, and we fertilised late. So it's understandable that these two are late. I would think that probably this one will go pretty, pretty crazy next year and the year after. But we still grew 14 tonnes of grass per hectare by just spelling it. Okay, so because it's a small plot, it's a small plot inside a bigger paddock, we just open the gate. So she's going to get fairly crash grazed. I think there's about 50 cows and calves in there. And it's only, it would be an acre and a half. Yep. Yep, we let it reseed. Okay, so first thing, die back, don't panic. It's okay. That's it. Thank you so much, Jim.
have we got any final burning questions or comments before we get into morning tea? Yes, we've got one there from Mandy. In terms of, you know, Bos Indicus, Bos Taurus content and the effect it has on land condition? Or? Uh, no, not really. It's more, yeah, it's more management than breed. Yeah. Yep. Okay, let's uh, move on to morning tea. It's just been served.